to watching Henry AI Labs. This is the first video in a series going over this popular reinforcement learning book from Richard Sutton and Andrew Bartow. The series isn't a course, but rather a series of videos complementary to each chapter in the textbook to help you follow along and uh, hear some insight on the key concepts. This book is available for free online, which is linked in the description, and it's also available for a print version uh, to purchase, which is also linked in the description. Reinforcement learning is a computational approach to learning from interaction with an environment. So this diagram is crucial to understanding the general framework of reinforcement learning. We have our agent, which sends actions to the environment and receives a new state or observation and a reward. Some of the key ideas to note in the first chapter of this book is the idea of policies, value functions, rewards, and models. So one motivating example to help you get started with understanding this framework and how deep learning fits into the reinforcement learning picture is with the cart pole balancing problem, which you can easily get started with through the OpenAI gym. So in the OpenAI gym, you have these state variables, the position of the cart, the velocity of the cart, the angle of the pole, and the pole's velocity at the tip. And then you can send out actions such as pushing the cart to the left or the right. So the agent is sending this action of moving the cart left or right along this axis and it receives from the environment these state variables and the reward based on whether it's kept the pole upright or whether the pole has tipped over and fallen over. So you can imagine processing this mapping, policy mapping from input state to output actions through the use of a neural network. This neural network shown in the Keras framework has the input dimension of four, the four state variables uh, reshaped to be a vector input to the neural network and then it outputs uh, two units indicating the actions to take on the cart pole balancing problem. The high level idea of reinforcement learning is that we're constantly mapping states or observations to actions in order to maximize a reward signal. So some of the key challenges to reinforcement learning are the classic search problem of exploration and exploitation, whether you should constantly take the action which you think is the best, or whether you should explore some new actions that you haven't tried before, and also the idea of delayed reward. Con uh, differently from supervised learning, the agents don't have an immediate reward signal for each action it takes. So therefore, it must learn to do credit assignment and to attribute the rewards to the sequence of actions that it's taken and the sequence of states it's observed in the trajectory. The balance between exploration and exploitation is one of the most heavily studied problems in mathematics and computer science. In order to obtain a lot of reward, the agent will prefer the actions that it's tried in the past and have been shown to be successful. But in order to find those actions, it has to take risks and try actions that it hasn't selected before, such that maybe it will discover a new action that has a higher uh, reward. So the exploration exploitation policy is basically exploiting means to act greedily, meaning that you take the reward that you expect to have, the action that you expect to have the greatest reward. And then exploring is where you act non-greedily, and you maybe sample a random action that isn't the uh, maximum expected reward in the list. So you could also imagine this being more complicated with stochastic tasks where each action must be tried many times to gain a reliable estimate of the reward because the reward itself has some randomness to it. So there are four key elements of reinforcement learning to understand from chapter one of this book. The idea of a policy, a reward, value functions, and then the optionality of having a model and the, tra and the differences between model-based and model-free reinforcement learning. So a policy is the mapping from states to actions this is what defines the agent's behaviors. So policies are usually stochastic. So you sample from an action probability distribution compared to in supervised learning where you would take the arg max of the distribution. So imagine this is our output distribution over different actions. In supervised learning, like an image classifier, we might imagine this to be cat, truck, uh, dog, deer, horse. And then we would take the maximum estimate and that would be our prediction for that class. But in policies, what we're going to do is treat these each as a probability of sampling this action, and then we're going to randomly sample one of these actions, and the probability being selected is according to the output in this uh, last layer of the neural network. In reinforcement learning, the reward is the signal for the reinforcement learning agent to make changes to its policy and try to maximize this uh, reward numerical signal. So at each time step, the agent sends an action to the environment, and the action sends back a new state and a reward. So in some environments like cart pole balancing, the environment might send back a constant plus one reward for keeping the pole balance upright and then minus one when it's tipped over. But in other situations like chess, the reward is really sparse, usually being zero at every time step until the end of the episode where it either gets plus one for winning or minus one for losing. So designing our reward functions and seeing how these reward signals could even be stochastic in uh, some examples of states and actions 
we see already sort of some of the problems and the characteristics of reinforcement learning problems. The value function is used to get a better sense of this reward. So in the case where the reward is an immediate signal, the value function is able to attribute the expectation of the reward to different states so that it has a sense of the long run and a longer term expectation of which states it might take and what kind of rewards it might receive in return. So you can imagine when you're playing tic-tac-toe, when you're placing your third or like when the second X is being placed on the board, you don't really have an immediate reward for that. So you'd assign a value function that can just tell from those states of putting the uh, third piece on the board of the second X, what kind of expectation you might, what kind of expectation of reward you might have given the different uh, permutations that you can place the X on the board. The model mimics the behavior of the environment and it allows you to do inference about how the environment might behave. So a model, when you use a model-based reinforcement learning system, you can do a lot of planning and considering future situations about the environment that might happen before you actually experience them. Whereas model-free agents are explicitly trial and error learners and that all their learning comes from experience. So generally the difference between reinforcement learning and supervised learning is that in supervised learning we have the exact correct situation to take for every state for the purpose of generalizing to states not seen in the training set. But in reinforcement learning we generally have a much sparser reward signal and we can't possibly label the correct action to take in every state but rather we receive the rewards based on a series of states and actions. So we see more so how this series of decision making is what generally differentiates reinforcement and supervised learning. So some examples of reinforcement learning and relating them back to this framework of agents sending action to the environment and receiving back a new state and a reward. In chess, a move is informed by planning and judgment of particular positions and moves. The agent sends an action where to place a new chess piece on the map and as a return, it gets the reward usually zero until the end of the game, but then it gets the next state, which is when the opponent makes its move as well. In a petroleum refinery, an adaptive controller would adjust the parameters to uh, optimize this reward function of yield, cost, and quality. And uh, so in this case, it's controlling the different levers of the system, and then it's receiving this reward based on how much it's producing and this uh, blend of different parameters according to the design of the reward function. So a really good example of this kind of control system is uh, DeepMind and Google's data center cooling bill reduction, which is linked in the description. A gazelle calf is born and then half an hour later it learns to run at 20 miles an hour. So the agent is sending these actions on forces to apply to its joints and then it receives back rewards for standing up or falling down and the observation is the next state, usually uh, a new description of its uh, like input parameters of its body. So a cleaning robot has the decision to explore new rooms to find more trash or to go back and recharge its battery. So if it runs out of battery, it'll receive a minus one reward and then it's also rewarded for finding trash. So it has to make decisions based on the input of where it is in the map and how much uh, battery it has. Filmmaking is breakfast is another example of a task that can be fit into the agent environment action observation reward framework. Except for this framework has a much more complex web of the behavior and the interlocking goal sub goal relationships. So the agent is seeking to achieve a goal or a reward signal despite uncertainty it's about its environment. Its actions can change future states. The chess moves, the different chess moves you take result in different future states. The levels of the reservoirs of the refinery are dependent on how you're controlling it at each time step. And the robot's next location and charge level of its battery in the cleaning example is dependent on the actions it takes. So goals are explicit in the sense that the agent can judge progress towards its goal based on what it can sense directly. So the chess player knows whether he wins, the refinery controller gets this signal and knows how much petroleum is producing, the gazelle calf knows when it falls, the mobile robot knows when its battery runs out, and Phil knows whether or not he's made a breakfast. Rewards are given directly by the environment and reinforce some learning problems, but the intermediate state value functions must be estimated and re-estimated and this is basically the idea of what the reinforcement learning agent is learning over its lifetime, is the estimation of the values of these intermediate states. So the most important component of reinforcement learning algorithms is efficiently estimating these value functions of states, and it's one of the biggest breakthroughs in reinforcement learning over the last six decades, is designing more efficient ways of value estimation. So one other interesting uh, thing compared in the book is evolutionary methods and reinforcement learning. So one way you might apply evolutionary methods to these problems is to apply tons of static policies, meaning deterministic policies, with separate instances of the environment. And then the policies that obtain the most reward are carried over to the next generation of policies, and these policies are mutated. And in using these policies in this way, you don't need to uh, evaluate the intermediate values of states at all.
So one reason why you might prefer reinforcement learning algorithms that use these value function estimations is that evolutionary methods ignore crucial information. So basically they're just uh, preferring probabilities that have the largest probability of winning, but they totally ignore what happens during the game, whereas value functions take advantage of this information to allow for a more direct search. Tic-tac-toe is a great example to get started with reinforcement learning. In this game, the policy describes the move or where to put your piece down on the game board given the current state of the board, and the value function is the estimate of the expectation of winning for each state given the current game board. So tic-tac-toe, most of the time we move greedily, selecting the action that would lead to the state with the greatest value. But an exploration move would mean to select randomly despite what, which uh, state has the highest expectation of winning. And then as you play the tic-tac-toe game, you update the values of states throughout experience. So this is the way that you would update the value functions, the temporal difference learning rule, which is something that we'll cover off further on in the uh, reinforcement learning book. So the temporal di difference learning update is basically you take the current estimate of the step and then you update it by a fraction of what you find in the next state. So as you see these backup diagrams, basically you go from move to move to move and you back up the reward using this temporal difference learning function to update the previously assigned values of each intermediate state. So the tic-tac-toe game has a relatively small state set compared to other things like backgammon that have many, many states. So this is where the use of neural networks becomes so useful because it gives you that ability to generalize from this experience to new states based on information that it might have be able to infer from similar states in the past. Some of the interesting questions that the book poses is self-play. What if the agent plays tic-tac-toe against itself with both sides learning and will it learn a different policy for selecting moves? Symmetries are also a very interesting thing to think about because some tic-tac-toe positions are really the same exact position, although they're uh, differently oriented on the board. Also interestingly is greedy play. What if the reinforcement learning agent doesn't explore at all and just always chooses the policy that has the highest uh, value function for the state? And another interesting thing is learning from exploration. So when the agent acts non-greedily and randomly samples an action, it doesn't do the temporal difference learning step on that, uh, on that decision it's taken because that's not really its policy. That was a random choice. So it's interesting to think about uh, what learning from exploration and how that might change the framework. Thanks for watching the explanation of Chapter 1 in Reinforcement Learning. Hopefully the main takeaways you got is this framework of the agent interacting with the environment through actions, states, and rewards, and the overall ideas of policies, value functions, rewards, and model-based versus model-free reinforcement learning. Please stay tuned for Chapter 2 of this book, and please subscribe to Henry AI Labs for more deep learning and artificial intelligence videos.